Cross-sectioning in G versus GM modeling is like X-section, but with over three times as many features and is in a full 64-bit 3D interpretive environment. You can think of it as cross-section cubed. It integrates with all current X-section cross-sections, geoatlas layers, and isomap surface, and with the new G versus geophysics, G versus petrophysics, G versus planner, and G versus web sharing applications. It automatically correlates all of your formations and fault surfaces as you pick them and predicts your tops as a guide where you haven't picked them yet. Plus, it can generate 3D surfaces and fence diagrams, subcrop maps, isochore maps, fault offsets and polygons, surface conformance relationships, and channel geometries on the fly. The area to be interpreted is in the Saskatchewan portion of the Williston Basin. It is in the Bakken Sand and Madison Limestone geologic section and is a combination structural stratigraphic play. The goal of our analysis is, is to see if there are any development opportunities in the field. I'll first examine the extents of the producing wells and interpret the tops within the Bakken section. I will leverage an existing X-section cross-section in the interpretation and demonstrate all the ways to correlate in G-verse geomodeling. I will integrate a petrophysical interpretation for G-verse petrophysics and include dynamically depth converted surfaces from G-verse geophysics in the geomodel. I will construct both a structural and sequence stratigraphic interpretation and examine subcrop extents and truncation edges. Finally, I will use buffered cross sections to interpret named and unassigned faults and then visualize the faults in 3D where I will alias the unassigned faults to the named fault. Update the geomodel, followed by picking drilling locations. Let's get on to the demonstration. Geoverse Geomodeling uses the same map control as in GeoAtlas in the map view, and that picking the line of section is the same way it is done in GeoAtlas to X section. For clarity, I only have the well based layer that I want to pick the line of section from as the selectable well based layer. So let's just begin by picking our first cross section. We'll go to the cross section ribbon, select define well to well, and then pick the welds that we want in our line of section. Once we finish, right click and end the definition. Just like when you're starting with the GeoAtlas to X section, the first time you bring up the section, it's unformatted. Now, the formatting techniques are very, very similar to X section. I'll just briefly go through the wells and logs and notice that it looks very similar to what you would see in X section. As a matter of fact, there's about a 75 to 80 percent overlap between the formatting between the cross sections in G versus geomodeling and those that are in X section. But for our purposes, I've got a saved template that's already pre-formatted. So let's go ahead and apply that. And there's our first cross section. Now, existing users may have many saved X section cross sections that they do not want to lose. Fortunately, X section cross sections can be consumed and interpreted directly in the GeoVerse Geo model. So let's pop over here to X section, and I'm showing basically that same line of section over here in X section. Now, to get this into the interpretation, you simply go File, Save As, then navigate to the area of interest and the interpretation folder, and then save the cross section as the common X section cross section geomodeling XML format, the .ssdx format. Then we'll return to geomodeling, right click on the cross section header, and update the list of cross sections. And there it is, our mini dip X section cross section. So let's go ahead and open it up. There it is. 
The only real difference you're going to see is that the correlations in this format are showing the actual geomodel surfaces. That's why that you see these, these lines are not straight. Now I can simply go ahead and apply that same template that I did on the cross section I picked manually. And now we have virtual, virtually identical cross sections between what I picked manually and what's coming over here from X section. So in this case, let's just go ahead and use our migrated X section cross section in our interpretation. Okay, let's just go ahead and look at this well right here. Select the surfaces tab and let's just look at the stratigraphy. Over here on the left hand side, we've got the list of surfaces that were being displayed on the cross section. The Torque is the bottom one. The Bakken sand is the green surface working up from the Bakken sand top. The unconformity is this orange surface, the sub Madison up through the Madison, that purple surface. And then the detrital surface is the unconformity surface at the top. Now currently we are flattened on the Bakken sand. I can toggle between structural mode and uh, stratigraphic mode simply by hitting the spacebar or control spacebar to get back in there. So let's go ahead and work with our picking methods. First, let's look at the ones you're probably very familiar with. Let's just click on this well number five. We're going to be working on the unconformity surface. And let's first look at the current edit selection of uh, that pick. There is a measure depth, and because we have a topology engine behind us, we also know the strike of that point, the dip of that point, and the dip azimuth. So let's go ahead and just copy this to the clipboard, because when we move this, it immediately updates with triangulation and minimum curvature smoothing, and it's put directly into the database. Now, if we want to put it back the way it was, just go back to the edit current selection, repaste that in, save that, and we're back to where we are before. Let's look at some of the other correlation techniques that are basically unique to G-verse cross-section that aren't in X-section. One is the concept of the active well. When I click on this, I've got a red box around the active well, so that is the currently focused well. I can now take this, slide it next to any other well in the cross-section, and then use the well slipping tool to slip the entire log so I can look at the correlation from whatever is being displayed at the top all the way down to the bottom. This sort of simulates the old techniques of using paper logs on your drafting table. So we just focus in about there, click on the, uh, the uh, unconformity surface to select it, get our picking tool and come right over here and make the pick. Turn off our picker. Now to reposition this well, I simply hit F6 and then reflatten it on the Bakken sand. There we go. Now for the next demonstration, we'll go ahead and just delete that point that I just made. And we'll go to the correlation tool. This works very similarly to the way that it works in X section. So up here I've got my correlation tool and I just drag a selection box over the log that I want to be my correlation log and I simply slip it over until I'm happy with the pick, make the pick. Now what's different between this and the one in X section is I can hit the escape key, maybe come over to another log and make another correlation section immediately without having to restart everything. Come back over, make the pick here and I have a choice now between overriding the existing one or doing a second observation. We'll just save this one. And again, this time if I hit the tab key, the correlation log goes away permanently. Again, let's just go ahead and delete this top. Next, let's talk about the type log tool. Again, it is similar to the type log tool in uh, the uh, X section. So here it is, new type log. And again, I'm going to draw it over that same well that we use for the correlation log. Drag it to the side so we can look at some of the things you can do here. By clicking on any of the surfaces within the type log, it automatically puts that in the selection mode and also turns on the picker. 
I can also grab the edges and move it up and down, stretch, squeeze, just like I can in an X section. But what's different, now I can come within the type log and squeeze and stretch within that type log into these formations. So you can look at um, thinning and thickening, not only overall in the, the overall type log, but I can look at them within the type log. Now return it to the original. I just right click and restore it to original tops. Drag it over make my correlation, click my picker, and then right click, and now I'm going to save this because I'm going to be using it later. So I'm going to save this type log. And by the way, you can use uh, existing type logs from X section in here, but once you've saved them, if you're doing the stretch and squeeze internally, it's going to be particular to this uh, Geoverse Gym modeling. So let's go ahead and then hide the type log. And let's delete that pick one more time. I'm just hit the delete key on my keyboard to delete it. It's a little bit faster. Now let's talk about another mode we have called quick pick mode. Quick pick mode was put in because we have a topology engine running behind. And if you have a very, very large AOI with many, many thousands of wells and you're modeling many, many surfaces and you have many of the modeling tools turned on, if you use the conventional mode and make a pick, it puts it into the database, and then it will try to update that geo model to keep it synchronized. Well, that may take a few seconds, and if all you want to really do is just to make correlations, you don't want to make, wait those uh, few seconds for everything to synchronize. You just want to make the correlations. So we're just going to be using the quick pick mode. So I'm going to turn on my picker and turn on the quick pick mode right here with this little tool. Now, I'm pretty familiar with where the pick ought to be, so I'm just going to go ahead and make it. Turn off the picker. Now, in quick pick mode, what it does, it makes an annotation on there. I can move that annotation to new positions, and it does not affect the database or geomodel until I'm ready. I also have multi-level undos and redos. This is something people have been asking for in X section for a long time. Well, we have this in the GVR geomodel and cross section. Once I'm happy with where that quick pick is, I simply save that quick pick. It commits it to the database and to the geo model once. Now, if I had several quick picks along the entire cross section, it would then just take the hit once, putting everything into the database and updating the model. So it's a real um, performance booster. Okay, let's go ahead and turn off the quick picks for now. Now that we've uh, correlated this cross section, let's go ahead and make another one. So back on my cross section tab, Define well to well. We're going to go northeast to southwest this time. Now, because I'm in a geo model, I don't have to stop at a well. I can click out here somewhere in the moose pasture and go ahead and end the definition there and include that as at the edge of my cross section. And again, I'm going to apply that template. And for consistency, let's flatten on the block and sand. Now I'm get the, the geomodeling uh, engine to help me make my correlations this time. I'm going to turn on the predicted tops. And these tops that are dashed are predicted by the model based upon the geometry of the wells that actually have picks, and, which is controlling the surface. So this is what we call a predicted top, and it can help us actually make uh, the correlation where we uh, have not yet correlated. But right now, I'm going to open up that saved type log. Open it up. There it is. Click on the unconformity surface there to select it. Come over here and do my slipping. And actually, I want the type, I want the uh, unconformity pick to be a little above where it's predicted. So let's go ahead and put it right there. Turn off the picker, hide the type log, and we're done there. Another thing I want to show real quickly is I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. There, that's pretty good. Another difference between X section cross sections and geomodeling cross sections is the headers up here, font is set independently than the font that's actually within the uh, cross section. Notice as I scroll up and down, the headers stay in place so you can s still see which wells you've actually got here, which I think is a real advantage. So back in view of the map now. 
And uh, let's talk about what's behind the scenes here in GeoRTC modeling. We have a topology engine that dynamically models these surfaces with triangulation and minimum curvature smoothing. So let's take a look at how we control that. From the Home tab, I'm going to go into the GeoSurface Model Properties dialog box. Now this is showing me the surfaces available to me in the currently active stratigraphic column. Now, GVerse Geomodeling also honors the currently active source list also. Now, it's best to put your surfaces in stratigraphic order because it is a topology engine that can do sequence stratigraphy, so it's important that you have your formations in stratigraphic order. Another thing to note is the source of these surfaces. Right now, I'm pulling in well-based picks. I could bring in an isomap layer, for example. I'll just pick one and use that as a source of a, of a horizon or a, or a surface here. But in this case, we'll keep it as well base. But right here, I've got the detrital, which is that unconformity surface coming in from my seismic volume, and I've got it attached to a horizon in G-verse geophysics. Now, this is being dynamically depth converted by the currently active velocity model in G-verse geophysics and being added to, the, uh, to my geomodel here dynamically. Now, the next thing we can do, because we have a topology engine, is we can look at the relationship between surfaces. For example, here the detrital coming in from the seismic volume is going to be controlling the conformance of the detrital that is being picked from uh, well-based picks. So, in other words, away from control, I'm using the detrital surface that's being depth converted from the seismic volume to control the overall detrital surface. Likewise, I've got a hierarchy here of the Bakken sand upward. Now, this, this is a stair-step fashion. Don't think of this as being stratigraphic. This is meaning that the Bakken sand is controlling the conformance of the Bakken sand top, which is controlling the unconformity, subcrop, and submadison, all the way up to the Madison here in turn. Now, I've got different ages of of uh, unconformity, so I can actually network that a trital is the youngest unconformity, and therefore it's going to crosscut these older unconformity type surfaces. Likewise, I can create zone maps that are either going to be the gross thickness, net thickness, or net to gross ratio based upon any intervals I may have picked on that cross section. We'll deal with this a little bit later. Now, let's look at how we have uh, wells loaded into the inter interpretation. Now, this is a relatively small project, or AOI, so I really don't have a lot of problem with loading all the wells. But I want to demonstrate this load on demand feature. This is put in several years ago, again, as a performance enhancement feature. If you have a large AOI with many, many thousands of wells, and you're modeling many, many uh, surfaces, and you have on a lot of the modeling tools, it may take a little while to, to uh, work with the cross sections or update things. So, but you may not be working with tens of thousands of wells at one time. So what you might want to do is do the load on demand and only load in those wells that you need to work with at the current time. By default, any wells that are in cross sections, like these two cross sections, those wells will be loaded into the model automatically. I can also load wells that also have the tops picked and the zones picked in the geosurface model properties box. I can load in from one or more of these uh, well lists over here, or I can manually add by simply selecting the wells in the map view and dynamically adding them to the cross section or to the uh, cross section and to the map and the geo model. So let's go ahead and cancel this. And in map view, let's turn on my detrital surface. Now this surface is being modeled just from the wells in these two cross sections. And it's being modeled dynamically with triangulation and minimum curvature smoothing. Now to add in the rest of the wells from the act from the uh, area of interest I'll just draw a selection box over that area, highlight those wells, right click, and load those wells into the interpretation. Now let's look at the relationship of the structure, the, the detrital surface, to the wells that are producing. And you can see there is a plunging nose coming from the west to the east, and that may account for some of the trapping mechanisms of these wells on the east side, 
But looking at the current structure, it sure does not explain exactly what's going on to the west. So we need to have something uh, to help us understand what the overall tracking me measure, um, uh, mechanism here. It's going to be somewhat structural, but there probably is some kind of stratigraphic component to this also. So let's look at a cross section again. We'll pull up our mini dip cross section. And let's look at our petrophysical model. By the way, just as an X section, we can be running a petrophysical model and display the results on the templates being used in the wells. In this case, we're using this Archie interpretation user-defined equation set coming from Jeeves Petrophysics. So let's go ahead and open up Jeeves Petrophysics with that well. And I'm going to open up a session file. A session file allows you to save your layout that you were using the last time you were in Jeeves Petrophysics. So here I have a well log template, a cross plot template, and a report template up here. And I save that to a session file so it reconfigures your screen space for you. But for now, let's go ahead and just close the report and the cross plot. We're not going to be using that. And let's look at the model. First of all, I can toggle with the supply UDE. I can toggle this back and forth. And by the way, this is the new Jeeves Petrophysics in uh, version 2019.2, which I am demonstrating, which has been upgraded to full 64-bit. It's got this new ribbon interface, very much like Jeeves Shield Modeling, and much more modern and task-oriented interface. So let's look at our user-defined equation. Maybe make this a little larger fonts larger, and maybe uh, let's go ahead and turn on the color. Now, in, for 2019.2, uh, we can actually color key words and key functions and parameters within the model itself. So it looks more like a modern compiler and showing the difference between the different type of if then else, or this is, happens to be a curve, or this is a comment. Makes it easier to read. So I'm doing an Archie interpretation, and down here I'm calculating things like bulk volume water and hydrocarbon pore thickness. But down at the bottom, I'm calculating pay based on the uh, effective porosity being greater than 10%, water saturation less than 50%, and V-shale less than 40%. Likewise, I'm saying I've got good sand re reservoir if V-shale is less than 40%. Another nice thing about this version is if I scroll to the next well, my UDE dialog box stays open, so I can make modifications without having to reopen the user-defined equations dialog box. So let's go ahead and close this. And uh, just point out here on the depth track, the stipple pattern is my good sand reservoir. The green uh, pattern in here on these intervals is showing uh, good pay. So let's use curve data statistics and load up a template. This template is was in 2019.3 and allows you to recover any type of layout you've got here in curve data statistics so you don't have to set it up each time you come in here to run a set of parameters. Now we're going to filter the wells on just the uh, wells that have the logs that we need and turn on that filter. It takes down from 48 to 23 wells, and we'll run the, the, uh, the data here. We'll create it. And this is showing me my feet of good reservoir. Now I can save that to Zone Manager, copy it to clipboard, save it as text, but I created an isomap layer that we can now show back in Gverse Geomodeling. First, we need to turn off the detrital color. Color, turn off the color fill. And then up here, we're going to select that isomap layer showing the reservoir. And you can see the uh, hot colors are indicating thick reservoir quality. The cold colors are thin. And again, it looks like, yeah, there is sort of a draping of good reservoir over the plunging nose of this feature, but it's still really doesn't give us the full view of what's going on out here to the west. So let's, uh, let's just continue our interpretation. 
by looking at what's going on in the subcrop. So for right now, we want to turn on the conformance tool, the unconformity trimming, and the unconformity networking. And again, I'll just remind you what's going on here. So we're going to do conformance between these surfaces and the stair step. We're going to trim against these unconformity surfaces, and then we're networking things in the subcrop based upon this network hierarchy, being the detrital is the youngest unconformity. It's going to truncate these older unconformities. So let's update that model. Here we go. And notice when we did that, we are getting the benefit of the depth converted seismic surface. Now we have much more detail in the unconformity on the detrital surface. But let's see what's going on in the subcrop. So let's open up underneath the detrital and turn on those subcrop truncation edges. So this is going to be the truncation edges between the Madison, sub Madison, the unconformity and the Bach end. And to better see that, let's just turn on the Madison surface, for example. So here's a structural surface as it's being truncated, as it's coming up on this feature. I can also turn on the thickness of the detrital to the Madison in this zone map. So here is my isochore thickness of the unconformity down to the Madison surface. So again, there is a, a stratigraphic component, but it looks like that we are continuing to build reservoir to the west. So it looks like structure may be uh, the primary trapping mechanism after all. So let's go ahead and turn off the subcrop. And let's now look at our 3D model. So from the Home tab, I'm going to open up our 3D view. And let's open the uh, mini dip. And from here, we're going to go ahead and turn on. We're going to fill the surfaces based upon the lithology that's just defined in the strat column manager. And when I do that over here, notice that that same pattern is being displayed on the mini dip. Now, for simplicity, let's go ahead and turn off the, unconform the unassigned uh, northeast to southwest cr cross section and maybe bring the exaggeration up a little bit so you can see a little bit better in 3D that truncation of these reservoirs. Now, uh, when I click on the 3D view, my panel turns to my 3D view panel over here, showing me all of the elements that are available to me in that 3D view. One thing I can do here is come into the well that are in these uh, in that cross section. Turn on the surfaces in the wells for display purposes. Turn on the logs. And let's maybe show uh, a lathe this time, a little thinner change to a different font or different palette I should say and then on the uh, mini dip we're going to turn off the lithology color and turn on the interpolation now this is interpolating gamma ray uh, between the surfaces so you should be able to see uh, when, when we do that let's, let's Let's turn on this different template. There. You can see the interpolation of the gamma ray between the wells will also show up on the cross section over here. So basically what you see is what you get. We're actually accessing the same memory a location, whether you're in a cross section view or whether you are in a fence diagram view. So let's go back to the mini and turn it off. Turn off the, uh, just turn off the interpolation for now. 
And for simplicity, let's uh, look at the whole view and let's turn on the depth converted seismic backdrop. Now this is being dynamically depth converted as it's coming over from Gverse geophysics based upon the currently active velocity model. Right now we're still flattened on the Bakken sand top, so let's go ahead and hang this structurally. And notice that uh, the detrital surface is following that, uh, that uh, po negative to positive crossing right here pretty well. But the detrital sand is really not following what the, what the geophysics said it should dip down here. Now, I will remind you of the conformance relationship of this detrital sand as controlling the conformance of these other surfaces up against the detrital and conformity. So if I were to turn on, have that uh, Bakken sand selected, turn on the picking tool, and I'm going to turn on the quick picks, and let's just make a few modifications here something like that, turn off the picker, maybe make some adjustments, maybe down to there and down to there. Once I'm happy with that, go ahead and save that. Notice everything is now conforming much better. Likewise, I can click on the torquoise surface, and if I want to, I can click on any interwell point down here within the surface and say drag it to a new position. And I could save that if I wanted to, or I could just simply make another pick. Again, update that surface. Okay, let's turn off the quick picks. Make sure we have the quick picker turned off. Now let's look at everything in 3D and see what we've got. So there is our cross section with the, with the uh, depth converted seismic backdrop. Over here, we're going to turn on the detrital surface. There's the detrital surface. I can right click and uh, turn on the interpolation or the, uh, the uh, fill, surface fill. I can turn on its properties and I can do an overlay of, say, the well spots. So I can now get a better idea of where those wells are in relationship to my structure. And over here on the map, let's also let's turn on the detrital surface. So now you can see we're building an interpretation between cross sections, our map view, and our 3D, and getting a much better idea of what's going on with this field. So let's come back here and look at our mini dip and notice a couple of things. Let me see if I can put this in a window so you can see where we are. I've got what looks like some kind of discontinuity right here. If you look at the cursor tracking on the cross section of the map, you can see where I am. I got some kind of discontinuity here and some kind of discontinuity right here. Now we're going to call this discontinuity the big moose head fault because it looks like it's a bounding fault on part of the field. Now I need to make a new fault. So I'm going to call this my big moose head fault. And we're going to call it red because all faults are red. Turn on my fault picker for the big moose head fault. There's my fault picker. And again, I'm going to turn on my quick pick so I can make some adjustments without actually invoking the model or the database yet. So let's start making a few picks. And if I need to make some adjustments, I can just go ahead and make those now. It looks pretty good. Let's save the quick picks. Now, I do want to uh, also uh, interpret this discontinuity over here, but I don't know what it's called yet. It's just a discontinuity I see in the, in the uh, seismic backdrop. So I'm going to deselect the big moose head, turn back on my fault picker with the quick picks on. Let's go ahead and pick it maybe, uh, let's see, maybe something through here. Looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and save that. So I've interpreted a named fault, the big moose head, and also I've interpreted one that is not named. It's just something I've made note with uh, unassigned or generic fault. 
Now let's come back and let's focus our interpretation by looking back at our map. This is a larger area, but I really want to interpret right here in the in the area within my uh, big moose head field. So we've got a new thing for 2019.2. It's called modeling regions. Modeling regions allows me to subset my model just to the area that I'm interested in modeling. And it will only load in any kind of structural elements that are in within the bounds of the modeling region. So we're going to call this the big who said field modeling region add it let's come over here and we're going to activate it and you can now see that I've actually subset the model only to the uh, area within the modeling region. This will increase your performance because you're only working with those sets of uh, elements that are being uh, modeled inside of the extents of the modeling region. So now let's interpret the rest of this using a new, relatively new uh, cross-section tool called our uh, buffered projected cross-sections. So I'm going to select my buffered project, projected cross-section it may be start from here down to here, double click. And based on a buffer distance, uh, it will buffer in the wells into the projected surface of the uh, cross section line of section. Let's just load this template in so we can see things. Bring it down here and let's turn on the seismic backdrop. And again, I'm noticing over here on the right, I've got another what looks like a discontinuity, but I'm not quite sure what it hooks up to yet. <clears throat> so let's come back over here and make sure we're not have anything selected here. And we're just going to mark it as a generic fault. Again, using quick picks, we just click a few points here. like that let's save it come back over here to my map let's drag it to a new position it looks like I've got that uh, discontinuity right there let's make sure we don't have anything selected because we're going to pick it as another generic fault so let's go ahead and put a few fault points on here save my quick picks and then maybe drag one more spot over here. <clears throat> drag it down so I can see it. Maybe drag it back. It didn't pick up any wells, so let's drag it back over here. There we go. And let's pick... Well, let's see. It looks like I've got a couple of things going on here. I've got a discontinuity over here, another one over here. So let's pick both of them. So again, we're going to turn <clears throat> turn off the selection, keep it generic. Pick a pick here, deselect it, and then make another pick over here. And again, I don't have to save each time I make the picks. I can just go ahead and make both sets of uh, generic picks and, a, and a save them right there. Turn off my picker. Turn off the uh, quick pick mode. <clears throat> let's don't need this cross section anymore, so let's take it off. And let's see what we've got. <clears throat> I'm going to bring this 3D view into the full screen. Now that's one of the nice things about this interface. You can drag these panels out and you can put them in different screens if you want to to maximize your screen real estate. So over here in the 3D view we're going to turn on all the faults and I'm going to select, and zoom in here so you can see a little bit better, toggle on and off. You can see there's the big moose head fault right there. I'm going to toggle it on and off so you can see a little bit better. But I've got these other fault traces out here. I really don't know what's going on with them yet. So we have the ability in 3D to do fault aliasing. So by clicking on the fault aliasing tool, 
it turns off all the elements except the uh, fault traces. So I can spin this around, look at it, kind of make a decision that, well, I think probably this trace, this trace, and that trace right there are probably the same big moose head fault. Once I'm happy with that, I can go ahead and save that. It builds my fault plane for me automatically. I can come over here to my modeling tools. I'm going to turn on my fault offset and update my model. And maybe to better see that, let's just turn off the big moose head so you can see the discontinuity in the surface. Kind of see that surface tear right through there? Turn back on the big moose head fault. Let's put these two views side by side. Zoom out a little bit and reorient this the same way we've got the map oriented. And over on the map view, we're going to turn on the fault polygon for the big moose head. And you can see that cut right through here. And I can run my cursor over the fault plane, and you can see it track over the fault polygon in the map view. <clears throat> now, it looks like we've got to have a, a pretty good locations right here. It looks like we may have one or two more locations here, but let's take a look at what's going on with the other surfaces in 3D. So from the 3D view, we're going to turn on the Torquay, the Bakken sand top, and say the sub Madison. Now currently, each one of these is being modeled with their own particular uh, uh, palette or spectrum. But for 2019.2, we have the ability to actually aggregate the color. And I'm going to do a different color spectrum here altogether. Earth tones uh, one. Maybe this one. Earth Tones 1, and over here we're going to turn on the aggregate fill. By turning on the aggregate fill, each one of those surfaces is being modeled with one palette with the hotter colors being shallower and the cooler colors being deeper. So you can see which uh, common colors, so you can see the common colors come across here, uh, across the different surfaces. So it gives you a much better feel for the range of depth values you've got here. Another thing that will help us interpret this uh, 3D is to turn on the uh, clipping surface, clipping box, so I can grab edges and move them in, actually looking inside of the model a little bit better. And then turn those back off. and return to our orientation. So to recap, G-verse geomodeling has cross-sectioning that is far more capable than X-section is or ever will be. The tool is in a full 64-bit 3D environment and integrates with most geographics and G-verse applications. As you interpret your tops and faults in the cross-section, the topology engine behind the scene keeps track of your correlations, 3D surfaces, conformance relationships, fault offsets and polygons, unconformity edges and subcrops, and creates 3D fence diagrams of your open cross sections all on the fly. The cross section and surface model integrates with geophysical horizons and faults for the currently active Gverse geophysics interpretation and its active velocity model. Gverse gem modeling, cross-section, and surface modeling is simply the easiest, fastest, and most comprehensive way to interpret your geology on the market today.